All right. Hi, folks, and welcome. Uh, this is uh, Access for All Navigating Accessibility Supports on the Oregon Statewide Assessments. Uh, we'll start moving into some introductions, so I'll introduce myself first. I'm Mason Rivers. Uh, I'm a school psychologist, and I work for the Oregon Department of Education as the Special Education Assessment Specialist. And I'll ask my co-presenter today to introduce herself. Yeah, I'm Jennifer South. I uh, work at Northwest Regional Education Service District, and um, I'm an occupational therapist by training. I've been specializing in AT for, I've lost track, about 15 years, kind of um, doing both things a little bit, but uh, just happy to be here with y'all. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, it would be really great for us if those of you who are watching this live in the Zoom room wouldn't mind just dropping in the chat, you know, what is your role in education? And then are you with an agency or a district? It would be nice to see who else we've got here in the room. So we'll just give that a moment to see who comes up through the chat. And thank you, Deb, um, for dropping the access to the slides in the chat. Okay, some folks from William ESD. Caleb Kaiser, excellent. And I recognize a few of you on here as well. Okay, Eastern Oregon representing, all right. Awesome. Okay. And someone from another state, welcome. Awesome. Okay, if you haven't had a chance to put your information in the chat, feel free to do that as we continue on. So just a brief agenda for today, we'll be providing a little bit of background information about accessibility on the statewide test and in Oregon here and providing some resources for you to dive deeper if you're interested in. We'll look at a little bit of uh, data from last year's testing season, uh, session. I myself consider myself a um, data nerd. So sometimes I like to, you know, just <laughs> satiate that need to nerd out on some data. So if there's some fellow folks watching that feel that way, we'll look at a little bit of data. Um, and I got some graphs uh, that can kind of feel fun to look at. Uh, then I'll really be passing it over to Jennifer to talk a little bit about um, using some of these same tools that are available on our statewide assessment during classroom instruction and, you know, how we can ensure that students are prepared to use their supports when they get to their statewide assessment at the end of the year. Um, and finally, if we've got enough time, I'll provide a little bit of information about what the accessibility process looks like at the Oregon Department of Education. So a little bit of background here just to kind of set the scene. Um, all of Oregon's uh, official policy around what accessibility supports are allowable or available on our statewide assessment are outlined in the Oregon Accessibility Manual. So that's what you see here on the screen. Um, this includes, you'll see there, it includes our mathematics assessment, English language arts, science, our extended assessments, which are for students experiencing the most significant cognitive disability, our English language proficiency assessments, and it also shows um, what supports are available on our uh, Student Educational Equity Development Survey, also known as the SEED survey, um, and it's delivered on the same platform, so we're able to have uh, similar supports available. And um, I, I want to also mention, not only is this the official policy document, um, that it's really important that the intention here of the Oregon Accessibility Manual is to ensure that students are able to access their statewide assessments with the same supports that they use in the classroom for instruction and classroom assessment. Really, we're trying to make sure that it's um, a similar experience to them because we really want to learn um, how they're engaging with the standards and what their proficiencies are in the standards. And that is with the supports that they need and require. So that's really our overall goal here in trying to determine what is allowable and what is not. The other thing that I wanna mention is that we are part of um, a 
variety of consortium um, who have their own rules about accessibility. So our English language arts and math tests are created by Smarter Balanced. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. And then our English language proficiency tests are created by ELPA 21. And both Smarter Balanced and ELPA 21 publish their own manuals. And so we, um, we look at those manuals and we incorporate those policies into our own manual so that school folks don't have to read, you know, three different manuals. Um, but I will say in case you ever get interested and go look at Smarter Balance or ELPA 21, there are a few areas where um, Oregon has decided to kind of veer away from the recommendation from Smarter Balance and ELPA 21, and maybe we provide something a little differently. Um, but just wanted to let you know that that is uh, kind of an additional impact on the decisions that we make um, because we're part of those groups with other states. Um, a little bit more context here. So there are three levels of supports differentiated by availability to students. So if you look in the accessibility manual, you'll see things laid out like this. So universal tools are those that are available to all students, and students can use those based on their preferences and their selection. So they're just part of the system, and students can click away and do what they like. Designated supports in that smaller kind of square are supports that are available to students for whom the need has been determined by an educator. So it could just be their classroom teacher, it could be the test administrator, um, some educator who has said this student needs the support. And another reason for that is the supports that are considered designated supports, they have to be turned on by an adult or they have to be provided by an adult. So you'll see things where, for instance, the embedded calculator is a universal tool because any student can just click on it and open it. But uh, non-embedded, like a real calculator, that's considered a designated support because an adult has to know that that student needs a physical calculator and they have to make sure that student has the physical calculator when it comes time to take the test. So that makes it a designated support instead of a universal tool, kind of putting the onus on the adult to make sure that happens. And then finally, accommodations are available for students who experience disability and have a documented need in their IEP or 504 plan. So as this graphic indicates, you'll um, see that uh, students who receive accommodations may also ask, access designated supports as well as universal tools. So it's kind of like, um, you know, the closer you are to the center, you can still access all of the other tools along the way. Uh, additionally, the supports in the OAM are classified as embedded and non-embedded. Embedded means just that the tool is provided as part of the assessment platform. And non-embedded means that the support is provided outside of the assessment platform. And we're going to look at some, uh, well, we're going to look at some embedded. So examples of non-embedded would be like if the student needs a physical calculator. It could be things like if the student needs to test in a separate setting, or if the student needs a human uh, reader to read the test content to them. Those are all things provided outside of the platform. Um, and then embedded or provided inside the platform. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the most commonly used accessibility supports. So based on last year's test data, uh, Jennifer and I dug into the data a little bit, and we saw that the top use supports, and this is across our general ELA math and science test. So um, not ELPA, not the extended assessment. I wasn't quite able to get all that data together. Um, these are the seven most uh, used accessibility supports. So I'll note a couple more things. So the first is that the majority of these are considered universal tools. The only one that's not considered a universal tool is text-to-speech. And, you know, the big difference here is that an adult has to turn text-to-speech on for a student because it's considered a designated support, where the rest of these are just available in the system. And I'm going to show you what they look like here in a moment. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that we only have data on 
how often students use embedded accessibility supports. So we don't know for non-embedded supports that are provided outside of the system. We, we don't really know um, what folks are doing or um, how often those are, are utilized. So I'm gonna do that thing that you're not supposed to do during presentations and I'm gonna try and do some live demonstration and hope that it doesn't uh, fail miserably. So here we go. Uh, look at that, that was beautiful. All right, so um, I do wanna walk you through real quickly how to set this up. Um, I am gonna move pretty quickly, but it'll be recorded so you can go back and watch it. Um, Cause I wanna show you how to get into the system so that you can play around with these tools yourself. So I'm gonna demo those top seven on a practice test. So you'll navigate yourself to our um, Oregon Statewide Assessment System portal and scroll down to the bottom, and you'll see that there are sample and training tests. And these are publicly available. So parents can go in there with their students anytime. Um, you'll just leave this first page as is and sign in. Um, I like to select a fifth grade because we've got a lots of options. Mm -hmm. You can select any of our assessments here. Um, I am just going to go to one of our summative ELA math and science, select that. I'll do the <clears throat> ELA computer adaptive test. So that's um, what CAT stands for. And here you can see all of the embedded tools. So you'll see here's all the universal tools. You'll also see that they're by default turned on. Um, so you can toggle those on and off if you want the embedded designated supports. And you can go in here and you can turn on and off any of these and you can set the test however you want and you can go into the test and play with it. Um, the only one that made our top seven was text-to-speech. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on for items and stimuli. And I'm gonna turn on text-to-speech tracking as well so you can see what that looks like. Um, additionally, you can test out any of the embedded accommodations as well, minus dictation, which you can't test out. Um, but you can always reach out to me later if you want more information about that. Okay, and then you'll hit select. You have to go past these tests. Did you hear it? Okay, that sound. <laughs> um, so that's just to check and make sure the student's video and audio is working. You'll click that. And then there's also a text-to-speech uh, sound check here. So this text is being read aloud. Students are able to select a different voice pack if they have that installed on their computer. This text is being read aloud. They can also increase or decrease the This pitch. text is being read aloud. And they can increase or decrease the rate. This text is being read aloud. All right, and I'm going to put all those back so we can hear what they sound like. All right, so we'll go ahead and begin the test. Now I'm going to quickly demo these. So the most commonly used one is called the line reader. So you'll see up here at the top right, there's a line reader that I click on. And it just like kind of darkens the rest of the screen and just has that line available. Now you can progress the line reader by uh, clicking the down arrow on your keyboard. That's what I'm doing right now. Or you can use your cursor to select the line that you want it to highlight. And then to turn the line reader off, you simply just click on the line reader again. So that's the line reader. Um, the next one is the notepad. And the notepads are item specific. So you'll see we've got six different items here. So when I'm in the item, I can click on my context menu and I can open the notepad. And then I can take any notes I want and save those notes. And then you'll see that the note was saved for that item. A little icon shows up here. So when I go to item two, there's no note associated with this item. But when I go back to item one, I can go back and I can see whatever notes I wanted to take associated with that item. All right, that's the notepad. Um, the next most common was text-to-speech. So there's lots of different options here. So we'll start over here with the stimuli. So one way to access text-to-speech is you click on the context menu and click speech pack. Read the passage, passage and answer the questions. James Watt and the tea kettle. 
All right. And then you can stop it the same way. You also saw how the highlighting happened there, where it was highlighting the word that was read. Um, spoiler alert, we're supposed to have dual highlighting coming to the test next year. You're the first ones to hear that. So, um, you know, we may have to, if it doesn't come true, we may have to edit this video. Uh, no, 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 it's going to happen. So that's one option. Um, another option is the same thing, just by using the right click. So you can right click and do speak read the passage, passage and answer the questions from the beginning. Right James. click and stop speaking. Okay. Another option is to say I want to just start right here. So I'll just right click and I'll do start speaking from here. So this was not the first time he had puzzled here. his grandmother with questions that. Now, the final way that I can interact with this is maybe I'm a student that just has, you know, trouble identifying particular words. So I can just highlight what I want, right click and do speak Vapor. selection. OK, and then it stops speaking. I could also say, well, I want it to read this sentence and speak. Above selection. the fire, an old fashioned tea kettle was hanging. The water within it was beginning to bubble. A thin cloud of steam was rising from the spout. And then it automatically stops when it gets to the end of that selection. Now, over here in the item, there's also some different options. So I can go to the context menu and I can do speak question and options. So it will read Select the two the sentences that should be included question, in a summary of the last four paragraphs of the passage. Into the options. Option one James was from Scotland. Okay. I can also click on speak option. And then I can select the option that I wanted to speak. Option I just want five. This one. James failed many times but kept learning from his mistakes. All right. And finally, you can also do this with the right click, just like I showed. So speak options, start speaking from here. I can also click on a particular option and do speak option three. Option if three. I just want to hear that. James continued to live with his grandmother. All right, so those are all of the text-to-speech <laughs> ways to use text-to-speech in here. Um, text-to-speech is also available in Spanish on the e on the math and science assessments because those assessments are available in Spanish. Um, okay, zoom in and zoom out. This is pretty straightforward. You can zoom in and out up to four times. So one, two, three. Four. Um, that's where the zoom in maxes out. Zoom out. There we go. Um, there is a setting that you can turn on that the adult has to turn on in the system that allows students to zoom past um, those four times. But you know, we re we recommend that you change the settings around a little bit if you're going to do that because it can get a little wonky. Wonky is an official uh, accessibility term in case you haven't heard that before. Uh, okay, we've got three more. So the next one is highlighter. This one, you know, is pretty similar, I think, to anything else. So you um, just highlight with your cursor what it is that you want to highlight. You can go to the context menu and select a color, or you can just highlight and right click and select a color. Then if you want to remove a particular highlight, you just re-highlight it and remove highlight. Or you can just reset, and that removes everything that you have highlighted. All right, and then the last two, um, you know, when Jennifer and I were talking about these, we were kind of like, these are more like test-taking strategies than necessarily accessibility supports. But the last two, so one is mark for review. So, right, this is this when you're telling students as a test taking strategy, like, you know, don't spend too much time on this one question, you know, just give an answer, mark it, and then you can come back to it later at the end of the test. So that's available on here as well. You just click the context menu and I wanna mark this for review and it'll put that flag there and you can unmark it as well. And what that will do is when the student gets to the very end of their test, they'll get a summary page and then they'll be able to see what items they flagged and they can go back to those items and revisit those. And the final one is strike through. And, you know, this is a text taking strategy of just kind of striking through options that, you, you know, you want to eliminate some options. 
So that works a couple ways from the context menu, you would click strike through and then select the one that I wanna strike through. Or you can just right click on it and click strike through and it kind of removes that. So those are the top, um, the most used supports. And now we're gonna look a little bit more about um, what uh, that data looks like. Oh, how quickly can I get back here? Awesome. Uh, did that? Okay. All right. Uh, so looking a little bit of the at, at the test data last year. Um, so again, we were only able to look at ELA math and science embedded supports. And the tests that were included in this data are ones um, where students access the support on more than one item. And we did that to kind of maybe weed out students that were just exploring. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the exploring, um, but we wanted to know, get an idea of what students were actually using on the assessment. So um, real quickly here, this is looking at our top used supports. Uh, the gray bar shows uh, the overall percentage of test overall across all three assessments. So for instance, 26% of all tests had the line reader activated, but then you can see 53% of English language arts test had the line reader activated on more than one item. So you can kind of see, you know, in general, aside from mark for review, it seems like students are using these tools more often on the ELA test than kind of overall. So that's ELA. And then we see a huge drop for math, okay? So um, for the most part, the tools on math, students are using those less than the average, except for text-to-speech and mark for review, whatever reason that is. I don't know, I probably have to think about that a little bit more. Um, so that's that. And then science, we really see the usage of these tools really plummet on science, um, where they're, you know, ranging from one to 4%. So we're not seeing students use these tools as much on the science assessment um, as overall. Uh, from there, I wanted to show just a little bit of data looking across the grade bands to see you know, is there a difference between third grade and 11th grade? And so I have a, a graph for each of these tools that I'll just show you real quick. Um, so this one is for the line reader. You see that up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, I was I was very surprised that over 92% of third grade ELA tests, those students were using the line reader on more than one item. Um, and then, you know, that can, you know, Third, fourth, and fifth grade, those are still really high numbers, even into sixth grade. Um, but then we see this gradual decline um, in ELA. And then obviously we're seeing math and science, these being used less. But again, kind of a decline across grades in general. This is the embedded notes. Um, so maybe we're still seeing a little bit more usage of this at the younger grades than the upper grades, but not as significant of a slope. Here's text-to-speech. We're also seeing that being used more at the younger grades with a decline. Um, third grade on math, it actually outpaced ELA, just barely, but I thought that was interesting. Okay, here's zoom in um, and zoom out. I had to do them differently because of my Excel document, but you can see they're pretty similar and they're you know being used less and less as students go through the grades. Um, here's highlighter. It's kind of a little more flat than the others. Um, still rarely being used, you know. Um, it didn't even make it to 1% on the high school science test. It rounded down to zero. So I don't exactly know what that's all about, but. Um, and then here is mark for review. Again, within the one to 10%. And then the final is that strike through option. Looks like it's being used more as a strategy at the elementary 
um, than at the middle school. So you can go back and look at these graphs and pontificate around this um, <laughs> as long as you like. But uh, what I want to do now, now that you're understanding a little bit about what these commonly used tools are, I want to hand it over to Jennifer um, to talk to us a little bit about um, how these tools can be used in the classroom. And I got to stop sharing my screen so Jennifer can share her screen. Okay, and while I'm sharing, you can see um, Deb was asking in the chat if alternative access is an option. You can see if I answered that adequately while I'm screen sharing. <laughs> okay, let me take a look. Jennifer, we're still seeing your sidebar, your reading list. Thanks. Did, did, did you want that or no? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Not yet. Um, but you can see my screen. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, yes, um, diving in a little bit to tools for daily use. And um, I guess I always just want to start with this reminder that um, we're, we, we kind of looked at this I don't want to say backwards, but we talked about accessibility sports on the test, and now we're going to show them for daily use. In real life, what we want to do is mirror what students need on a daily basis and get, you know, give them those same supports on the test. And so really important, you know, this is a little excerpt from the Oregon Accessibility Manual that's just a reminder to people that students should always have experience using the supports, particularly when they are I would say at the designated support and accommodation level um, so that they're not trying to interact with those for the first time on state testing. That could actually result in reduced performance because the student's learning the tool while they're trying to take a test. Um, you know, I think the universal tools are a little less so, but I, I do think it's always wise to have practice with all of them. And there's really no reason to use a tool that they don't need to use. <laughs> and I, you know, I do wonder if some of those high numbers in the third grade, right, all these are new little buttons to try out. But I also think that there is some really logical um, reasons behind why the younger grade bands are using those tools, um, just when you think about where they're at developmentally with reading skills, right? So, um, so again, just reiterating, just it's really important that students are comfortable with the tools that that they're going to be using on a daily basis and during the test. And uh, the tools on the state test are great. You guys all just saw how nicely they work and you know they've made improvements over the years. They don't work exactly like the tools that students use on a day-to-day -day basis just because they're different platforms. And in today's world, there's so many different <laughs> supports available that there would be no way that those tools could match what every student is using on a daily basis. And so I really, really emphasize that, you know, students should be using tools daily, pair that with going through the practice test like Mason just showed you, and then your students will have the best chance of success on the test. So with that being said, um, I kind of approached this, you know, Mason was like, talk a little bit about like, why would a student want to use this tool and what type of activity or what type of, you know, in what situation in the classroom? And I may have kept this a little more um, big, <laughs> big picture than you intended, but um, this is this is where I'm at. So in terms of the line reader, um, just really functionally speaking, you know, the skills supported, why would a student benefit from using line reader? Well, it can help with visual tracking. Um, it can also help reduce eye fatigue. And we kind of noticed how the rest of the screen grayed out and just kept that focus right there on the line that they were reading. It can help uh, keep your place while you're reading on a screen. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that um, depending the tilt of the screen, it can be weird sometimes. It's not just like paper, you know, you look and it's like, wait, where did that line go? Where, where's my next line picking up? And so I'm um, just keeping you on your place 
is a really helpful feature. I mean, I've been doing a lot of reading on my screen lately, and I have been using a line reader because it just really helps me get through the content. And then um, you might have noticed when the screen is grayed out, there's less distraction on the screen, and that can help um, students that just have issues maintaining their attention or focus. And, you know, sometimes we say, oh, when reading longer passages, but the reality is also kids are on their screen so much these days, there's online curriculum and there are a lot of distractions on the screens. And so it can just kind of help um, reduce that clutter, so to speak. So zooming in or out, I'm not gonna lie, I had to think about this one when I saw how frequently it was used, I was like, huh, why are they zooming in and zooming out all the time? Um, but I did a little thinking and a little digging. And of course, you know, it's going to be to some degree, the skills that are supported are just your visual preferences. And um, obviously, for people with low vision, um, that they can really zoom in and have a better view of that screen. Of course, there are some other supports available on the test for that as well, the color contrast and just starting out with larger, larger font. Um, and this can also help with focus and attention, but when you think about even if a student has the larger font enabled on the test, and then maybe there's a graph that they need to look at on the test or a particular image and they need to see the detail. So zooming in can really help you get down to that granular um, level of detail and see it better. Um, just focusing on a part of the screen. And earlier this year, I had a student teach me something that I love to share with everyone because I was like, that's genius. So he uses a text reader all of the time. And um, the observation was, oh, he just messes around with the size of the screen and he never gets to what's happening. And so I sat down with him for a while and he zoomed out to the point where <laughs> you really couldn't see the text on the screen, but he had figured out if he zoomed out so that the entire text was on the screen, the text reader could then read it without interruption. So some text, re text reader tools um, can only read what they see on the screen. And so he had figured out by zooming out, he could you know, just get that going. It can also help with just providing context. Sometimes we're like really right here, but there's a lot more to the page and you wanna see everything that's there. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the main reasons for zooming in and out. Study tools I grouped together and, you know, Mason kind of mentioned this, mark for review. I don't have a daily use tool for that. I think that really is kind of a test taking thing, but I left it up there because I'm a completist, if nothing else. <laughs> so um, strike through, I do, you know, I, I use that from time to time if I'm editing something and I don't quite want to get rid of a thought yet, but I don't want to be visually cluttered with it. I'll strike it out so that I can, you know, um, know that I'm done with that piece. But really, I look at these as being study tools kind of as a grouping. And really, study tools help support executive functioning skills that students planning and organization of task completion and just kind of their they're thinking about something, the organization of their materials, and then working memory. If you need to jot a note down or you want to highlight a section so that you don't have to keep it in that in, in your mind and you can go on to something else. So um, things, you know, you just can keep thoughts in an easier place if you have some notes or you can really make things stand out, key concepts. Uh, ruling out options, supporting vocabulary, and you can use highlighting like during close reading activities. And, um, you know, it's really depend task dependent upon what the teacher has asked you to do, but highlighter tools um, can help, you know, if you have a student go through and highlight all of the, you know, could be something really simple, like highlight all the verbs and with this color and the nouns this color, or if we're doing more advanced literary analysis, it can be highlight all of the characteristics you see of this character in one color and others in another color. So it can be really helpful in organizing, um, interacting with those educational materials. So then text to speech, 
really there's you know the the main skills that it supports you like how I have the task supported reading just one <laughs> I don't know I was like is there more I mean there's a lot of different aspects of reading right but um so really students with learning disabilities that maybe have issues with decoding or fluency um students that might have just issues with the visual processing and they do much better when they compare the auditory with it. There is research that shows that listening to text to speech along uh, pairing that with reading improves comprehension for all, all readers, not just students with disabilities. And so I, you know, I recommend to students sometimes higher level content, they're like, oh, I'm fine when I'm reading this book. And I'm like, that's great. But if you're reading your, you know, physics textbook, maybe you want to listen to it too, because pairing those things together can really improve your comprehension. So um, I think enough said about that. Okay, this is an overwhelming chart here. <laughs> I like to give people resources. And so what I did, I'll explain it to you so that if anyone wants to go back later, they kind of know what they're getting into here. So I took uh, each column is one of the kind of tools that we talked about. And then I cross-referenced that with like a product that would help you to do that. I will say right here, I don't necessarily endorse any product over another. I was really just looking for things that I see often. People might see other things. I am curious um, at this point, people that are present, if you don't mind throwing in the chat, which I can't see very well, but someone can tell me what platforms you're encountering most often. Is it Google and Chromebooks? Do you, do you still see a lot of iPad usage? Um, I'm guessing we don't really see a lot of PCs out there, but um, I am curious just so I know if I'm hitting the mark or not. You've got and, one for Chromebook. Okay. Two for Chromebook, one for iPad and Chromebook. Okay. So um, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is pretty fairly Chrome browser focused, but I guess I just wanna say that if you, know, if you leave with the idea that these supports are really pretty much available across all platforms, across all devices anymore, it's just a matter of kind of digging in and finding where they're at. So I just um, picked out what I thought would be one of the more common um, situations. And yes, I'm deciding how brave I am in this moment, Mason. It went really well for you <laughs> diving off into your presentation. But I think it's a little more engaging to do it in real time than to watch like three or four or five little videos. So I'm going to get brave here. And the plan is to dive off. And I was going to demo these tools across a Google Doc with Read and Write running on it. Let me just find my notes so I don't miss anything. All right. Well, it's there somewhere. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. So this is a two for one here. This is not about the state test, but I can't help myself and I hope it goes well. So first of all, I'm, I, I'm going to open up a worksheet here to interact with. And you can see I have five files here. Four of them are PDF files, which typically, if I just open that PDF file, I kind of get, this one is letting me highlight text, but I'm not going to have much else available to me in terms of accessibility tools. So here is a really cool trick that has been available for a long time now. And I think it's one of the best kept secrets out there. So instead of the traditional left click to open the document, you can right click on a PDF in your Google Drive and choose open with, and then choose Google Docs. And it does magical, we'll see what it looks like, optical character recognition. And it extracts the text and dumps it on a Google Doc for you. Now, sometimes it leaves the... Um, the image on the top and then you scroll down and it has all of the text extracted. In this case, it just extracted all of the text, which means that PDF was probably in a fairly accessible format. 
you can see there's a few little formatting issues. It's not too horrible though. Like I can just go in and space um, and clean up a little stuff, which I'm going to jump over. And I cleaned that stuff up ahead of time because I wasn't that brave. <laughs> um, so now I'm just going to dive in and show you a few tools. So for anyone that's not familiar, this tool going across the top here is uh, read and write for Google Chrome. It is an extension and this is the paid version. Um, I do have some information about that in the slide deck for you to look into. There is a free version that offers reading tools. Uh, in the free version, you get the play, pause and stop um, and nothing else, I think. But in this case, that would be enough. So first tool we've been talking about is the line reader. All of the line readers that I'm aware of work a little bit different than the one on the state test, but read and write has what I think is a pretty close approximation. They call it screen masking and I just toggle it on. And now I've got a bar that I can pull up and down the document. If I don't like something about that bar, I can come over to their um, triple dot menu here, settings and screen masking. And I can actually change the size of that. I can change how dark the background is um, and the opacity of the that one. So that's a pretty cool um, feature and that is really helpful for keeping your place. So I'm gonna toggle that off again. Um, Zoom, I feel like we probably don't need to spend a ton of time talking about Zoom or demoing it, but just so everyone's aware, um, Read and Write Toolbar does not have a Zoom feature because you would just use in your Google Docs. You can just flop down there to Zoom um, or Fit. You can do all kinds of things with it. And if you're not in a Google Doc and you need to resize your whole screen, you would just come up here to the triple dot menu. I heard on a video saying, often called a snowman. And I'm like, I've never heard that before, but I'm giving you that little tidbit. <laughs> I don't know what it is when he's laying down, <laughs> he's falling over. Um, but there's just zoom right here. Um, super easy to resize the entire screen and then this little box next to it will just bring it full screen and get rid of the um, the all the extra stuff. And then you have to press F11 to get rid of it. So there's Zoom, text to speech. I'm going to go ahead and use the read and write toolbar for this. And we'll see if I poked the right buttons when I screen shared. Read the story, oh, then answer the questions. No. Can you School starts in oh, a week okay, and I today is the day. Done. So again, um, there's all kinds of settings in here. There's a lot of voices and languages to choose from. You can select continuous reading, which will just read the whole page. Um, if you turn it off, it's supposed to read to the end of a sentence. If the text isn't formatted in nice, neat sentences, you might get kind of a variety of how much it decides to chunk before it stops. So that's something you can play around with. And again, just like on the test, you can adjust um, the speed. Uh, this particular doesn't really let you change the pitch, but that's not usually a big deal. There's enough voices to choose from. Then, Notes. Okay. I'm weirdly excited about the notes here. So a couple of options. Um, obviously, I'm guessing almost all of us have shared a Google Doc with a colleague and we leave note comments for each other. So that is one way um, you can, it looks like I was playing with this earlier and they saved. Um, oh, I opened the history. Yes, that's what I did. So comments, you can easily just highlight some text and this add comment here, and you could leave yourself a note. It stays there until you get rid of it. And sometimes even longer than that. <laughs> um, but the, the one that I am actually really excited about is I've been getting more and more into using Google Keep alongside of a Google Doc. So Google Keep, so, okay, Google added this feature here called a side panel. And I have my side panel showing where you can see my calendar, the icon for Keep, a task list, et cetera. I can hide that if I don't like it. 
um, or if yours isn't showing, this is how you get it. There's just a little caret arrow there. You can show side panel. You open up Google Keep and you can just start, you can take a note, you can type it right in there. It's uh, It automatically put a link to my document in there. So later on, I can go back to Google Keep. I have all of my notes right there. Vice versa, if you start in Google Keep and you take a note, you can now just go in um, and add that content into a Google Doc just by playing around um, with the buttons here, add to document. And just again, as a side little bonus information here, um, kind of using the idea of a word bank or some vocabulary support, having a Google Keep note pre-done, say you're in a biology unit and you can give a student some uh, visual support and some, you know, some definitions there. And then you'd be able to use text -to speech over that to listen to that if you needed to. So I have just become a really big fan of Google Keep. It can do so much for you. And you can also label everything. So you could label all of your notes like ELA, whatever, or per, per a unit. So um, I could probably do a whole session on Google Keep because it's cool. <laughs> so there you go. Dig into Google Keep. Then what are we on? Highlighter. Again, these last two things I think are pretty straightforward. Um, both. Oh, look at that. My toolbar closed up. Got, oh, oh, hello. There we go. Um, so Read and Write has these four colored highlighters right up here and pretty straightforward. You can just highlight a word, choose a color. Um, one thing that Google or that Read and Write does is if you have several words highlighted, that one, this little circular arrow here is collect highlights. And if you click it, it'll say, which colors do you wanna collect? And when you click OK, it creates a new document and it pulls all of your highlights into a new document. So that's another way to keep some notes. Um, and I think, you know, if I was a classroom teacher, I think it'd be really cool to have students interact with these kinds of tools while they're doing the lessons and uh, get them familiar with and using these things. Uh, then I'm pretty sure the little broom is just going to sweep them clean. And I'm guessing everyone knows how to use a highlighter in a Google Doc. You just highlight something, choose a color. You have lots more color options, but you're not going to get to collect them into a new note. So trade-offs. And then strike through is just under um, format and text and strike through. So if this was a multiple choice test, I could be practicing strike through just like I do on the other. Of course, this is a, a freestyle and the benefit, right, of me changing this into Google OCR uh, or doing the OCR in Google is now that my student can listen to it. And then if they were using voice typing or speech to text, they could just type their answer right in here. So... I don't know if anyone has any questions about that so far. So all of these little videos, let me go back to the slideshow. These are professionally done videos I found. They're not videos I made, which means they're better. <laughs> so they're all little professionally done videos about how to use kind of each one of those things. And you can learn a little bit about some of those different products. And just again, a note, as you can see, those tools are a little bit different than through the, the statewide testing portal, but similar enough, right? And um, they have the same functionality. Here, I just gave you an idea if these any of these are new to you, you can see which things are free and which things cost. Um, I haven't talked about Helper Bird. I learned about that earlier this year. There is a free version and it has some really nice, um, they call them dyslexia tools and it has a couple of different options of line readers and they just made the line readers as a free part of that tool. So that's something you could look at. And my last disclaimer is check with technology services <laughs> at whichever agency you work for because there's a lot of um, 
a lot of considerations with privacy, student privacy and data sharing that they, um, they may have an extension blocked for you, but it might just be that you need to ask them to review the data policy or the privacy policy and they may go ahead and green light that for you. So um, if you see, I, I don't know how everyone's agency works, obviously, but if you see something blocked that, um, that I've included here, to my knowledge, most of these, you know, these companies are willing to sign the privacy agreements and, and enter into those agreements with the exception of, I was trying to find a free, an option for a free reading line extension. So this one right here that I linked to, it's just a, a Chrome extension. Um, as you can see, it says my admin blocked it. I think they just, if I ask them to review it, because it says the things that I look at, the developer has disclosed that it will not collect or use your data, not being sold to third parties. You know, those are the things. If you saw right away that, oh, they're going to collect your data, I probably wouldn't bother asking for it to be um, reviewed. But if it looks like it might pass muster, then, you know, you can ask for that. Oh, yeah, we can skip this because we're getting late on time. So uh, the side panel, I just, the reading mode, I just learned about this. I'm also really excited about it. Doesn't really have anything to do with the state <laughs> test. <but laughs> it's, um, th this is an example of what it does though. I did a side-by-side -side screenshot. It, it declutters, it's built into the Chrome browser, declutters your screen. You can manipulate the text. Um, it's a great tool. So I left you information there to look it up. That's great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Would, would you keep sharing your screen? <laughs> yes, I will. I'm, so I'm always so impressed on. anytime I come to anything related to accessibility, the amount of resources that people provide. It's always like, look at this, <laughs> look at this, try this. I love it. I absolutely I, love it. You know, it's just when you learn about tools that can help people and they're easy to access, that's the thing. For so long, we've known about great tools, but it's like, oh, you know, 10 million yes. steps to get there, but they're just becoming so embedded in everything. It's great. Yeah. If if folks will bear with me for 30 seconds, I have three more slides and I just mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit. Um, so we have an accessibility panel at the Oregon Department of Education and all of our policy related to accessibility um, filters through this advisory panel. Um, we've got a couple of the panel members on the call today, Jennifer being one of them. Um, and uh, if, you, if you're interested in who's currently on the panel, you can click there and see uh, this panel reviews recommendations made for state level accessibility policy. Sometimes they propose studies um, for the department to do related to accessibility, and they also advise the department um, just around general, um, you know, what to do when we're trying to write policy that is um, for the entire state. Um, and if you're interested, or any of you watching this later, if you're interested in joining the Oregon Accessibility Panel, we would absolutely love to have you. That application this year is going to go out in May, um, and we'll try and make it widely available. I usually send it to Deb to send out to the um, accessibility world. So um, anyways, next slide real quick. Um, there are a little bit of information about how accessibility requests work. So there's two different things. Anyone can um, recommend a new accessibility support for the Oregon um, Accessibility Manual. So there's information about that on page five of the manual. And you can say, hey, we use this support all the time in my school, and it's not in the manual. Can you please consider adding this to the manual? And we have a whole process that we go through um, where we collect research and the accessibility panel reviews it and gives a recommendation. And there's lots and lots of work before it shows up in the accessibility manual. The other thing that I want folks to know about is we do have a process for temporary approval of an individual unique student accommodation. I realize I need to make that into an acronym. I don't know what it would be, but <laughs> it's so long. This is for a circumstance where a student has a disability that causes them to need a, a, a really unique accommodation related to their disability so that they can access the assessment. So this may be 
Um, something like uh, I had a student who uh, has to access virtual manipulatives because they have cerebral palsy and are unable to physically use manipulatives, so they have to use an eye gaze machine to access them on the computer. So the district just requests that. We go through an internal process at ODE to review the student's IEP and any information, and then we approve those for just a one-time use. Um, but we want folks to know that that's an option. We don't want folks to go, oh, well, the, the OAM says no, so I guess I can't let my student have it. <laughs> we want to make sure that folks know they can always reach out for clarity um, and they can apply for one of those individual unique student accommodations if that's what's necessary. And folks can always reach out to me to get more information about that.